All right, now something you might not know about me is that when I was in college, I spent a summer working at Colonial Michelin Mackinac, and I fell in love with the uh, fur trade period of the 1700s, mid to late 1700s. I had ended up actually writing my honors thesis at the University of Michigan about archaeology from the Fort Michelin Mackinac during the 1770s and 80s. Um, I also am a fiddler and play music from that time period, and so I'm really glad that I got to see this tea, because this one meant a lot to me personally. Um, so what we're going to do to, to this afternoon is we're going to go back in time. Now, the pioneer, first pioneers came to Troy in 1819. Um, the United States was already established. Um, this was a territory, um, I think. And the pioneers that mostly came here were American citizens, mostly moving here from New York State and the East Coast. But as we know, Detroit, as Sid, the city, was founded long before that. Um, and the first uh, and Native Americans lived in this area. And actually, we know that Johnson Niles in 1819, and, and he and his family encountered Native Americans who were still living in this area in the 1820, um, in, in 1820s and into the 1830s as well. Um, so the Native Americans were the first people living in Michigan. And starting in the, uh, mostly in the 1700s, the French were sending out explorers and voyageurs to establish a fur trade with the Native American populations here in, the, in our area, in the Great Lakes region. So what we're going to do with this afternoon is we're going to go back in time, imagine it's the mid-1700s, Michigan is still a wilderness, it's still a forest. Um, there, Detroit has been established, but we don't have the, the towns and other things like that. Mackinac is established, but this area is still um, forest, streams, rivers, lakes, and so we will, are going to meet Chanel Picor, and he will um, take it from here. Thank you. Back in 1701, when Detroit was founded, more and more people uh, came here from French Canada, from Nouvelle France to Canada. Detroit, Detroit, was supposedly in its heyday in around 1740. And it was at that time that you started to see the emergence of something called the Veille. Can you say that with me? Veille, which is a social gathering. And I really feel behind. <laughs> here we go. I'm up close and personal, just like French storytellers should be. The Veillé uh, was, how do I say, um, it was brought from the old country, but it flourished here because there weren't any opportunities for entertainment. So the, the troubadour was hired, and a family would host him for two days, and they would invite other couples and so on. Children were invited as long as they were quiet. <laughs> and this veille went on for two days. Many times the troubadour was, was also a musician. I don't play the fiddle, I play the guitar. So, but you will be hearing some fiddle music later because for some of you who are willing participants, I'm going to teach you a French-Canadian dance. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, you want to do that, Dorothy? I gotta take her back here too. Really, if you can walk, you can do this. <laughs> the only excuse you could have for not doing this dance was Maldi Raque, which is swelling of the feet because of snowshoes. And the snow's not here yet. <laughs> now, when the French, uh, how do I say, circumnavigated the Great Lakes and they worked their way inland, I don't know if they ever went down Larson Drain or not. <laughs> That's a good one, eh? Oh, well. In the wintertime, the voyageurs were known as Ivranu, which are the winter dwellers, because we couldn't paddle our canoes in the icy streams and rivers and so on, or lakes. So we had to dress a certain way, and Monsieur, you can come up here and help me with this. Yeah, that's right, you. Here comes the interactive part. You, know, you won't need the scarf. <laughs> That'll be the last thing you'll need. Well, if you were a voyageur, first thing you'd have to have was something to cover your head. 
Okay. Hello, my friend. Hi. What's your name? Jim. Jim. Huh? Jacques in French. I know a man. His name is Jacques. He's got a head as hard as a rock. Mark. Could you take a step forward? We're going to put this on Jacques' head. Hope it's not over your eyes. Good. Then, of course, now this could also be used to carry things. Then on top of that, we might have a toque, a hat, yes. Very good. And, of course, a sash, and this, wasn't, uh, this was worn to uh, protect the stomach muscles because voyageurs had to lift uh, heavy loads. Their, at least their weight and supplies, half of their weight in scrap iron. So if you could lift your hands above your head, and are mm -hmm. you married? Yes. All right, so your sash gets tied in the back. Could you take a step forward? Yeah. And here's why. I'll play his wife, he gets to play Jacques. You say these words. Are you ready? Yes. The wine is ready? The wine is ready. Take a, take a step. Take a step this way. Take a step. That, go, this way. Yeah, go ahead. Walk, walk, walk. The walk. wife says, oh, no, you don't. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you get your leggings. Not only does it help to keep your trousers up, keeps critters from crawling all the way up them at night. Excuse me. And I'll cut back in front. Then, of course, you get a blanket coat. Where's this? You're going to wish you had this tomorrow morning when you start showing. And when the north wind starts to blow, and in the language of the people that lived here 300 years ago, it's pronounced Kiwaden. That's north wind, not casino. So <laughs> put the hood up like this. And if you were lucky, you got your own beaver mittens. Wow. And of course, a blanket. But you know, this would keep you nice and warm, but it wouldn't keep you dry, so every voyageur got one of these. Oh, we got some photo opportunities right here. Wave to your wife. Now, what do you say we take Jacques put him in my Grand Canot, my uh, Saturn view, and we take him down the road here to the police station, and we have him walk around outside the police. I could just see it now. Uh, 11 Mary 6, call the station. We have a bear out in front of the... Uh, <laughs> so this would keep you nice and warm and dry, and you would, if you happen to be out in the environment, of course, you lit a fire, if perchance you had a canoe, if the water wasn't frozen over, you would sleep under the canoe. You'd take it out, flip it over, sleep under the canoe, and you would stay nice and warm and dry. And so, big round of applause for our friend Jacques. Now, I will leave the rest to you. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, you can just toss it right over here. You can just walk out the door, that's true. <laughs> now, the Yves Renault, the winter dwellers, when they were stuck in one place, there really wasn't much to do except tell stories and tell more stories. Maybe play a little music, gamble, tell a little bit more stories. Many of the stories that they learned from the region, they learned from the native people. He's walking away with my sash. See how easy this. <laughs> Come on back here. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> Some of the stories that, uh, that we, we hear today from French Canada uh, are derived from a group of stories called the Tijon stories. Tijon means Little John, and they were brought here from the Old World. 
taking a step outside of time, I'm glad that I, I, have, I, I have an opportunity to study this now. Uh, I've been a public school teacher for 30 years. I have this time off, so that's why I'm able to be here with you today. And I'm retiring in June. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I'm going back to school. I'm a grad student at Eastern Michigan University, and I'm studying oral tradition. So I'm just learning a, a great deal, not only about my own heritage, but the heritage of Michigan. Hmm? How about that, eh? So let's start with a story close to my heart, and little Dorothy's going to come up and help me with that. Are you ready? Come on, Dorothy. I'm going to get this chair and put it right up here. And we're going to get this out of the way. Come on, Dorothy. And can I lift you up? Up you go. Oops, stand up. You just need to stand right there. And look, there's a camera. You're going to be on TV. Let's wave. Hi. Well, here is how this story goes. It was a story that is common to Michigan, told by the Anishinaabeg people, and it goes like this. A long time ago, there was a little boy who lived in a forest, and he kept a fire alive for all the animals. You see, Michigan at the time was covered in cold and ice and snow 11 months of the year, only in one month was the snow allowed to go away so the sun could shine. There was a little bird who lived in the forest. Her name was Peachy Key. Can you say that? Peachy Key. Peachy Key. And she would sing like this, Peachy Key, Peachy Key. <laughs> Can you sing that? Peachy Key, Peachy Key. Yeah, just like that. And she had white feathers from her head to her tail. Well, one day, Key weighed in the north wind, and let's make his sound. Are you ready? You're going to need your hands and your voices. <laughs> Good work. Let's do it again. He sent down an icy breath of wind and thought, why can't I own Michigan year-round? Well, it was so cold and the wind was so fierce that the fire was going to go out and the little boy was, was afraid. And it got so cold that many animals went down south or into their burrows, all of them except brave little Peachy Key, the bird who lived in the trees. And Peachy Key said, are you ready? Say it nice and loud. Can I help you, little boy? Can I help you, little boy? And the little boy said, yes, Peachy Key, help me. And little Peachy Key flew down, but I, I want you to stay up here so they can see you on the carry of the TV. Yes. Yeah. And little Peachy Key fanned the flames with her wings. And the little boy grabbed as much firewood as he could carry and brought it back and put it on the fire. And there was a warm, toasty fire casting long shadows on the trees. Well, this greatly angered Kiwaden, who sent down an even icier breath of wind. And so, little Peachy Key, she turned her back to the wind and spread her wings and protected the fire. Well, the great spirit Manitou saw her bravery and stopped Kiwaden and said, Kiwaden, you are great indeed, but today, the bravery of little Peachy Key is even greater. From now on, Peachy Key, your feathers won't be white. Just a little bit of white will show, but the feathers on your chest will be orangish red. And the feathers on your head and back and wings and tail, I see what you're looking at, will be brown, singed by the smoke of the fire, and your beak, I'll make it as bright as the sun, and you will come back to the people and creatures of Michigan every springtime to let them know that soon the spring planting will begin. But when the trees lose their leaves, you must sojourn far away and give back to Kiwaden what once was his. Now I ask you, what bird is Peachy Key? Do you know? I see you looking at a bird down there on the it's your robin, yes. It's your robin. Peachy key, peachy key. Does it make a sound? No. no? It's oh, all right. Batteries are broken. Modern technology, <laughs> huh? So that is the story of Peachy Key. Look at bright as the sun, 
red like the fire, singed from the smoke. Well, you want to know something, Dorothy? Mm -hmm. From now on, you can have another name. Peachy Key. <laughs> and you can keep it with you. You can keep it with you forever and ever. All right? Good work, Dorothy! <laughs> Yay! Good job! Now, what grade are you in, Dorothy? First grade, oh, that's where I learned to be a teacher. I taught first grade for three years. I really did. Because my, my first year, I was a special ed teacher, and I got laid off. <laughs> and then our, then our director called and said, I have some good news and not some good news. Good news is we have a job for you. The not so good news is how do you feel about teaching first grade? And I said, Glenn, I will teach anything. So now it's time to guess the animal. Here's, well, it's actually a creature. It's not really an animal. Its name is Sugami. Can you say that? Sugami. Make sure you say this. Sugami. Sugami. Oh, you're going to think it's a snake, but it's not a snake. Many years ago, in this place that today we call Michigan, lived a creature named Sugami. Sugami was as big as a person, and it had wings and a spear out the top of its head or its face, and it took the blood of all living creatures. And all the living creatures got together, and all of you will play creatures, and they said, Oh, great spirit! Oh, great spirit! Send us someone, Send us someone. to save us from Sugami. Great spirit sent keeper of the heavens at first to reason and counsel with Sugami. But Sugami wouldn't listen. All Sugami ever said was, <laughs> And so it was. A great fight ensued. And keeper of the heavens picked up Sugami and threw him on a rock. And his body exploded into millions of droplets of blood. Oh, my goodness. And from those droplets of blood came millions of other Sugami. And they flew around the head of Keeper of the Heavens, and he couldn't fight them all. And he ran back to the Great Spirit and said, There's nothing that we can do. Sugami will forever be with the people and creatures of Michigan. And so it was the Great Spirit once again said, Sugami, I can't let you live in Michigan year-round. When Kiwaden takes Michigan back, you go away. But when he gives it up, only then you can come out. And that's why some nights we hear Sugami in the summertime, singing in our ear. <laughs> what is Sugami? Mosquito. Mosquito. <laughs> Very good. Here's a story farther to the west, or comes from farther to the west. There was an animal named Shikog. And little Shikog, I want you to know something, lives in Troy, Michigan to this very day. Have you, se have you seen my show before? <laughs> Well, now that you know it, here is the story of how skunk came to be. <laughs> Little Sheikog lived in the forest, but always by himself. None of the other animals would have anything to do with Sheikog. They heard that Sheikog had great medicine, and so it was they always took a wide berth around him. Well, one day, a Wendigo, which is a monster, was very hungry and came charging through the forest looking for something to eat and all the animals ran for cover even Maingan the wolf make his sign with me let's make his his sound <laughs> Mugwa the bear <laughs> that's right Wingizi the eagle All of them ran for cover, except little Sheikog. Well, that Wendigo went to Sheikog and said, aren't you afraid of me? And Sheikog said, I fear nothing. <laughs> Good point. Well, that Wendigo made a fist and pounded little Sheikog into the ground. He thought a little tasty, pasty lunch would be awaiting him, and he reached into the hole, and out came a little voice. Is that the best you got? <laughs> well, the Wendigo said, show yourself. 
And little Shekog emerged from the hole, showed himself in defiance, and turned and raised his tail and walked away. And within minutes, the Wendigo was scratching at his eyes, <laughs> gasping for breath, and fell over dead. <laughs> And all the other animals said, oh my, did you see that? Everything we've heard about Shekog is true. And so it is even to this day. All of the other animals, except dog, takes a what? <laughs> hey, he wasn't there for the story. Who knows where he was? Take a wide berth around Shekog. Now, the name Shekog sounds mysteriously close to a city in North America. <laughs> Chicago. Chicago, yes, you know that, Dorothy, Chicago. That's what Chicago means, stinky place. <laughs> place of the skunk. And I love telling this story in western Indiana and Illinois because inevitably there's somebody that comes up and says, says hey, you know, that's not what we learned here in Chicago, huh? <laughs> we learned in Chicago. And it means like wild onion or something like that. No, it doesn't. It means stinky place. And don't let anyone ever fool you, tell you any different. Well, I, I told you some dangers hmm, that exist in the forest, Sugami and Shikog. Well, you must have a friend if you're going to be in the forest. And I need a volunteer. You want to come up and do it again, Dorothy? All right, come on up. Let's see, let's come on up here and we'll put you on your chair so people can see. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. So people can see you. And I'm going to get on this side of the chair. Come on up. Atta girl. Do you, like, do you like to cook with your mama at home? Mm -hmm. What do you like to bake or make? Like desserts or dinner. Oh, yeah. Do you like to bake brownies? <laughs> Cookies? Mm -hmm. Soup? I never, I mean, cook soup. Never cook soup? Yeah, I never. All right. Well, do you ever see Mama cooking soup on the stove? Does she stir it? I never actually see her. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you never see her doing stuff. Well, that's... Yeah. Then I... Dad makes the soup? Ah. Oh. And my family, Dad made soup, and we always prayed after we ate, so... <laughs> Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stir a big pot. Well, here is how this story goes. Two animals are walking through the woods. One is Maingan, you already know who Maingan is, and the other is his friend Animush. And as they're walking through the forest, they stop, and Animush raises his nose and smells and says, oh, I smell something good to eat, coming from Dorothy's cooking fire. Let's go ask her, and maybe she'll give us some scraps of food to eat, because it's... It's very cold and we're very hungry. And Maingan said, no, I will not go with the human. If you go with the human, so be it. But you and I will forever be enemies. And Animu said, oh, please don't be like that. We're very hungry and it's cold. And, and even if it's just for one night, what do you say? Come on with me, we'll ask. Maingan said, no, I will not go with the human. You go with the human and we will be enemies, and if we meet in the forest, we will fight, even if it's unto the death. And so it was, they went their separate ways. Maingan deep into the forest, where he resides today with other Maingan. And Animush into the camp of the human. And Animush, oh, he was very hungry. <laughs> Please, may I have something to eat, even if it's just scraps of food, because I'm very hungry. Hey, what do you think the little girl said? Um, yeah. she, no. she said no. <laughs> That's okay. Say no. No. Back to the forest with you. Can you say? Back to the forest with you. Oh, she's good. I like. <laughs> if I feed you now, if I feed you now, I'll have to feed you forever. I'll have to feed you forever. Attitude too. <laughs> Well, Animush thought for a moment and said, you know, if you let me stay, I'll make with you a good trade. When you go hunting, well, I'll go hunting with you. And I'll always be by your side to protect you. 
And with my nose, I can smell where the game is, and we can go find something to eat together. Or I can rush in and scare it out, and you can catch it. Or if you want, why, you can stay here, and I'll go hunting and bring it back. No, I don't think so. I need you to go with me. Would you go with me if I wanted to go? No. Oh, please? No. Oh, she's going to be stubborn. Animush thought, when you go to sleep at night, why, I'll curl up right at your feet and I'll protect you because I'll know if danger arrives, I'll use my ears and my nose and my eyes. And I will rush out and meet that danger with my teeth bared for battle, sounding an alarm. But when you come home, I will rejoice. I'll be so happy, I'll want to play. Would you want to play with me? You can throw a stick and I'll go get it and bring it back and we can do it all day long. It'll be so much fun. Please, may I stay? And the little girl thought for a moment and said, yes, you may stay. As long as you keep your word. Come and sit by my fire. Can you say that? Have something, to eat. have something to eat, and let us get to know each other. And let us get to know each other. And from that moment on, Animush and the little girl, they were best friends. <laughs> now, what dog do you think Animush might be? A wolf. He's related to the wolf. He's a cousin of the wolf. You might have one at home. Really? No, you bet you're getting close. You might have one at home. How did you know, anyone here, how did you know it was dog? Anybody have an idea? <laughs> Who likes to come out when you're making food? Scraps, remember scraps? Who likes to protect your house? Ah, the dog. You know, something else is missing from that story. Something that Animush whispered to the little girl. Your kind might not know how to love me, but my kind will always know how to love you. And so it is, even to this day. Good job, little Dorothy. She's a good little actress. Is this on? Hello. Oh, there it is. A little on the loud side. You may have seen one of these, a jaw harp. If you had 16 of these, you could trade 16 for one beaver pelt. This is true. This, is, this had trade value. We know that uh, here in Michigan, especially up until the 1840s, there were fur trappers who were descended from the French. A lot of them lived near uh, Saginaw. So, let's hear how this sounds. Hopefully my dentist is in today. <laughs> No one knows exactly where the Native American flute originated. Some people say it's in the southwestern part of the United States. Others say it's the northwestern tribes or southwestern tribes of Canada, northwestern tribes of the United States. But one of the legends that holds true for this, we can still find it in the literature today, is that uh, this is the device a young man used to propose if you lived in the Northwestern tribes. 
And he would take his flute, and it wasn't anything like this. Uh, typically, they were made out of bone or a hollowed out uh, branch, but typically a bone. And he would sit outside the lodge, and he would play. Now, the woman that he wanted to marry knew ahead of time that he was going to be arriving. And she would wait in that lodge for a long time before she came out. And when she came out and sat next to him, so the legend goes, that was her way of accepting his hand in marriage. Now I see we have one, two, three, four gentlemen. So I'll tell you right now, we won't have a clue about how to answer this question. So, <laughs> ladies, why do you think she waited so long to accept his proposal? Contrary, that could be. Looking for a better offer. What, what was that? Looking for a better offer. Looking for a better offer. Maybe. Exactly. She was going to have something to say. She wasn't going to be pushed around. Any other ideas? You, who said that? <laughs> Absolument in French. This is true. She wanted to make sure she wasn't marrying a quitter. Because when times got tough, she wanted to make sure that he would stick it out. And that he would be a good provider. Showed something about his courage. His, his, uh, I don't know how to say that in, uh, in Ojibwe. I wish I did. Something about his character. Thank you. Wouldn't be moved by a song like that. Huh? I'm going to contrast that now with a French song. <clears throat> Typically, uh, the songs that the French sang Remember, if they had lived in this vicinity for quite a long time, they knew native ways because it was the natives that helped them stay alive. And they also brought some of their uh, traditions and songs and, and stories from the old country. Here's what I need you to do. Sing along with me. Let's see. Good key for you. you. That's too high. You, you, you. How about this one? You, you, ba. Can you sing that? Oh, very good. Yupa Yupa up on the river. You'll never see me, darling. Yupa Yupa up on the river. You'll never see me there. All right. That's your part. Let's take it all together. Are you ready? Yupa Yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa Yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. And let's repeat it. Yupa Yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa Yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Now, the way I understand it, this song was sung in bars. What a surprise. <laughs> or pub, you know, public, pub, uh, public, uh, how do you say, uh, public restaurants, pubs, uh, you say pubs, right? Taverns. And during that chorus, that was the person's turn to chug as much whatever he was drinking at the time. Kind of reminds me of a Picor family reunion. <laughs> An old... <laughs> It's an old song called Chevalier de la Table Ronde, Knights of the Round Table. 
You know that song? No? Chevalier de la table ronde, à goutte en voie, si le vin est bon. Means, oh, knights of the round table, this sure is good wine. <laughs> my favorite verse is, uh, there I am with my feet up against the wall, mon pied contre la maraille, et mon bouche sous les robinots, le robinet. My mouth under the spigot. So, that's <laughs> Memories of my communion. All right, so let's. Uh, <laughs> One Sunday night, you see, my dog Francois and me went out for a stroll to seek some company. A visit we did pay to the lovely Jane Philippe. I'll give you all the story you are bound to keep. You ready? Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. I lighted up my pipe, which was the thing to do. And to the ladies of a house I sang a song or two. And to the lovely Jane I bowed quite politely. Would you like to come and sit next to me? You ready? Here we go. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. She smiled so scornfully. Why, yes, of course, said she. You've come to me this night to play a joke on me. Unfaithful man you are, don't speak of love to me. I know a hundred girls you call your share of me. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. She led me to the door and said, Geno Picard. You leave this house and go away, and you come back no more. When you are old and gray, you might just change your ways. But you will be too old to have a fiance. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. And so it is, my friends. The story's at an end. Listen well, remember clear. What has been said? Too many women bring you trouble. Best to be a happy couple. Wanna know why? Cause two girls are too many. Three's a crowd and four you're dead. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Nice and loud. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me, darling. Yupa yupa up on the river, you'll never see me there. Good job, audience. <laughs> Woohoo! Do I have time for one more story and then the dance? Yep. yep, all right. Well, I need a volunteer. Preferably, not Dorothy this time, it's gotta be somebody older. Very close. All right, there we go. Thank you so much. And your name, madame? Phyllis, oh, come and have a seat. Welcome, bienvenue. Here's a story from old French Canada. Now, let me ask you something, historical society. 
What usually takes place in Michigan that involves a certain kind of tree in March? Maple syrup. Maple syrup. Here is a story about maple syrup. Goes like this. As it turns out, the main character's name is Philippe. Hmm? Philippe, he rents a cabin from Madame Phyllis. And every year he promises that he's going to pay her rent for this sugar cabin because he goes to the cabin in March and harvests the maple sap. And Madame Phyllis always says, Philippe, when will you pay me the money you owe me? Soon as I sell all of my maple syrup and sugar and so on, I'll, I'll give you what I owe you. And she says, that's what you've said. That's what you've said. For the last 10 years. For the last 10 years. And you've never paid me. And you've never paid me. And Philippe says, well, this time I will pay you. Well, as it turns out, Madame Philippe, uh, Felice, can we say Felice? Phyllis, what would you prefer? I don't care either. All right. Phyllis Felice, try to make it sound French at least. She's a widow, and she's running out of money. And Philippe, he knows this, but do you think he cares? No. He wants to make profits from his maple sugar, maple syrup. And so he goes to the cabin, walks in, and there's the big pot, and he starts a fire, and the smoke starts to travel up the chimney, and he hears this eerie sound, and you can do it with me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He stops and listens. Nothing. Oh, must be my imagination. And so he stokes the fire, and he hears it again. And now he runs outside, and he looks, and the forest is silent. This is starting to get unsettling. He goes back and stokes the fire again. And here's the sound. <laughs> and now he runs out in the forest and says, who's ever out here, stop playing this joke on me. It's not funny anymore. But it's silent. And he walks back into the cabin and he thinks, maybe it's the ghost of Madame Phyllis Phyllis. Maybe it's her ghost of her husband. And he does it one more time. And the sound now is louder than before. Well, Philippe is so scared, he feels the hair on his back stand up. There's a picture for you. Huh? <laughs> and he runs out of the cabin, and he runs all the way back to the village and pounds on the door, and Madame Philippe Phyllis is sitting here in her chair, and he walks up to her and kneels down and says, oh, 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 madame, I am so sorry. I owe you so much money. I, I can't live with it anymore. I, I think it's the ghost of your husband come back to haunt me. And he gives her all the money that he owes her, and she looks at it and says, with interest. With interest. <laughs> oh, of course. Pays her everything he owes her and goes back to the cabin. Oh, I'm glad that's over with. By now, the fire has gone out. And so he makes a new fire and stokes it. And he hears the sound again. But this time, something flies out of the chimney in front of his face and out the door. It was an owl. I knew it. You knew that. The moral of the story is, Maple syrup might be sweet, but a clear conscience is even sweeter. <laughs> Good job, Felice, Phyllis, Madame. Mm. Well, I'll need four or five volunteers, male or female. Now, I want you to know that the oldest person who's ever done this was 93 years old, bless her heart, Rogers City, Michigan. She did, the, yes. Oh, are you from Rogers City? Well, I go up there, yeah. So, and I wish I could remember her name, but as she was doing this, this dance, she was waving to people, and they were all applauding her. So again, 
You don't have Maldi Rake, no snow yet. None of you look even close to 93. So, some volunteers, please. All right, come on up. We're going to make a line. Yes, very good. Can I move this out of the way? All right. Here is how we do this. We're going to do it in the old Bretagne style, which is Brittany. And we're going to do it, it's called Andro, the Andro style. And so we hook our pinky fingers. And let's move the line down as far as it'll go this way. That's, yeah, about, that's good. We're going to take eight steps, Edouard, to the right. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's probably easier we do that way. And then uh, um, eight steps, a gauche to the left. One, two, three, four, five, six. And back again. One, two, three, four, five. And back again. One. See, I told you it was easy. Five, six, seven, eight. Then we drop the hands at the side and we clap three times. And step in place three times. And we put our hands down and shake them and See, aren't you sorry you're not up here? <laughs> Clap again. And step again. And then we start from the beginning. We connect pinkies, and off we go. Well, I'll, I'll come right up here to help you. All right? To help every, not just you, but to help everyone. So let me cue up the music. I hope you like the music. This is uh, a recording that I made with some of my friends. We call ourselves Trois Bouffons. In, in French, that means Three Stooges. Maybe eight. <laughs> All right, we'll get some more sound here. What's that? The music was better than the dance. Oh. Well, my friends, our time together is at a close. I've enjoyed being with you today. I know it's, it must be difficult sitting in some of the, the, the hard chairs. And besides, I'm all out of stories. <laughs> Hardly. 
My name is Jeanne Picor. I will be at the Troy Public Library with a children's program this summer for uh, uh, Think Big Read. That's the name of the, the theme for this, uh, this summer. So uh, hopefully, and you know, I can't recall the date, but if you go to the library's website, uh, you can certainly look it up there. Uh, I'll also be at the Macomb Center for the Performing Arts. The uh, next building over is the Lorenzo Cultural Center for uh, Maple Sugar Time. That's going to be March 24th. And I also play in a, in a musical group called La Compagnie. And we will be at that center as well, April 25th. I believe that's a Sunday. And we celebrate music of early Michigan from the time that the French arrived all the way to the Scots and Irish uh, came here. We also do uh, a few polkas, believe it or not. <laughs> but we also we have, we have a dancer, so uh, you are more than welcome to come and, and be with us on that date. I have one more thing to say. It would have been my job 300 years ago to be your scout into the back country. That's what my people did. We were scouts. And we would go ahead of the rest of the company and we would light a fire in the distance so that the travelers would see the fire and know that food and shelter and safety awaited them. Of course, fun as well. I hope you had some fun this afternoon. I know I did. I did. Great. You did too, Dorothy Peachy Key? So here is my hope, my friends. I hope that we will meet again in this lifetime. If we do not, well, then we will meet again in paradise. <laughs> Thank you. And I make you this promise. If I get to paradise before you do, I'll light a fire in the night sky so that you can find your way. Thank you so much.